Live from the Deer and Deer Hunting Headquarters, welcome to Deer Talk Now. Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Dan Schmidt along with Brad Rux. We have a great show in store for you today. We're going to talk about, we're going to show you some videos on really cool looking deer and why a deer is acting weird. Brad, we're going to talk about that in a minute. We're going to talk about food plots. If your food plot failed, Brad's going to give you some tips on what you should do to fix that right now. We're also going to talk about scent spray and usage in the field, answer some questions. We got questions from everybody, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Google+, everybody's been sending us questions. We thank you for that and keep them coming because we're going to keep doing this every week. Everybody who has a question that's answered on the air is going to get a special prize pack from Deer and Deer Hunting. Brad, how are you doing today? Good, excellent. It's actually cool a little bit. More rain, which I absolutely do not need. We're trying to get our fall plots in and the area that I have is fairly wet normally and this year it's really wet. Uh, we just got the tractor down this past weekend for the first time all spring. First time all spring. So. You know that is that that is just amazing that we're in, well into July. We've made it. It's going to be a really good growing year. Yeah, two years ago remember the drought the corn was all peeling over. It was you know three feet tall and peeled over. It was so dry and this year it's you know well above. Interesting point. Yeah. I'm going to pick up on that right now and this is not even a question but it's a question that I had because I looked at I googled it this morning because it really had me going not deer related, but sweet corn related in our garden. And everybody says, and they actually have this problem with field corn. Why is my corn falling over after a rainfall? And did you know this? And when it grows too fast, it doesn't have a spot. Well, there's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is there's a maggot in the ground that will give it, uh, they call it corn borer or something, yeah. disease in the corn stalks. That's why it's falling over. I did not know that. So they said you're not, well, farmers know this. You're, well, you do it, rotate your crops. Yeah. They say that's why you rotate your crops. So if you have your corn falling over, it could be an insect disease. It could be something in the ground. Um, that you could be planting it too shallow. That was another thing. They said the recommendations is an inch, inch and a half. They say actually for sweet corn, three, four inches deep, and that'll help keep it up. I didn't know that. That same thing can get into your brassicas. If you plant brassicas over and over and over, same thing can happen there. They get that, that same kind of disease, and it ends up decimating your plot. So that's why I'll never put a plot in for longer than two years with brassicas, and then we always kind of rotate them. So I have my own little rotation that I use, and, and it's successful. It works. Yeah. I got some food plot questions coming up here for you, but first we actually have a video that Tyler's going to show you here. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna call up the question that we had to go with it. Um, this is a really cool video. This came across. We've actually seen this one a couple times this year. And um, the title. This is a guy who posted it on YouTube. People have been sharing it on our Facebook page, and they've been emailing it to me and asking me what's going on with this buck in this video. It's pretty interesting. And actually, I've seen variations of this over the years. But this one's interesting. This was taken in fall. The buck is walking around, he's got one antler on, and this guy's walking up to this hedgerow, as you'll oh, see. Yeah. And um, he, he says, well, what's going on here? Why?" It, this guy basically walks right up to this big, mature whitetail, grabs onto his antlers, and says, hey, buddy, what's going on? This is probably what's going on with that, which a lot of people didn't know. There's a thing, and we've re reported this, we've had stories on this, cranial abscess disease in whitetails. It's actually very prevalent in mature bucks. And what this is, is a buck, when he gets to be three, four, five, six years old, uh, it, it could be from him just the basic act of him shedding his antlers. More often, it's when that buck gets an injury, and it's usually from fighting. If that the pedicle base gets broken, it gets breached somehow, there gets to be a wound there, and it gets a bacterial infection. And what happens is it develops a disease called cranial abscess disease, and it is what it sounds like. It's cavities in the brain that will, it's pretty gro gruesome when you actually see those bleached skulls when they're done, they actually have holes in their head. And uh, basically it leads to this buck's demise, he gets almost like dementia. Uh, they get loopy, they start walking in circles and these are some of the symptoms. I can almost bet you that that's what's going on in this, in this video right here. The buck is loopy, he's got a busted antler. Chances are he, in this, this disease usually manifests itself over weeks and months. A lot of times it can happen faster if that 
uh, bacteria is actually in the environment. What can you do about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's Mother Nature, and what we say is Mother Nature can be a cruel teacher. This is what happens. But they also said it's more prevalent in areas that are managing for mature bucks, which is pretty interesting. So you get all the fighting. <clears throat> you get all these, you're fighting, you get a lot of broken antlers. Nothing you can do about it. It's something that happens. But uh, if you see something like this, uh, that's probably what's going on. Something internal, probably some kind of brain disease like that. But cranial abscess, we found, is uh, very prevalent in places like Texas and Kansas, parts of Missouri, parts of Illinois, especially up in uh, Canada where bucks grow, uh, grow big and old. Iowa. In Iowa. This, yeah, a lot this of times, happens. you know, a lot of people, when they send in that footage, they think that the deer is blind or, right. or that there's some other issue, but that's typically what that's it typically is. That's typically what it is. It's something weird going on like that. So that actually wasn't a... A specific question from an individual but it's a it's a kind of a cool clip to start the show with we got a couple other questions I forgot to mention we're going to show you another video here in a minute on a cool new product in the store but our guest today is going to be Kendall Baldry Brad you know him and just give a quick intro before we get to that part of it yeah Kendall's the the brains behind the Cahaba River camera and a lot of people have never heard of this system basically you know anyone can get a live webcam up and and we have one up that we have up on the website right now that Real Deal Mineral is sponsoring and the deer are just absolutely hammering it and quite a few of the questions have been boy I wish you guys would have tell me how to get this up on my place well we're going to do it today so we're going to do it today and we're going to get Kendall on the line if you want some cool uh, video to watch while you're not wanting to look at us, check it out on the home page. It's the Haber River live feed. And it's a live feed of a camera in the field right now so you can see if there's turkeys out there, deer out there. We've been seeing all sorts of things. So that's yeah. coming up. Brad, a couple questions. I'm going to start you with this one. Um, actually, let's start with the food plot question that came in. And this one came in this morning. Um, guy was out there. It was on his property. He's got a six-acre plot, huge destination plot. He said it's not a little kill plot, six acre plot. Uh, for whatever reasons, he, they had a farmer that's supposed to plant this for them every year. I think the farmer got sick, couldn't do it. They were supposed to have corn in there. Now he's sitting there with a six acre fallow field. He said, what do I do? First thing you gotta spray those weeds because I'm sure if it's fallow, those weeds are gonna be two to three feet tall, especially with all the moisture that we got this year. So I'm gonna spray, spray it with a Gly, 41% Gly. You know, you can get it at, at Flea Farm or you can go buy the Roundup, which is gonna be a lot more expensive. Once that's dead, you, can, you got a couple options here. You can use, you know, if it was my six acre field, I'm gonna probably plant uh, brassica and winter wheat mixture, but I'm probably gonna plant the brassicas a little bit light this time of year and uh, get those in. If you're planting winter wheat or the cereal grains, you wanna plant those later. You wanna plant it up here. We're out of the Midwest and Wisconsin. I don't try to get mine in until about August 15th, uh, August 21st, anywhere in that window. That way I got nice new growth by opening day of bowl season, which is the second week in September. The thing about cereal grains, you don't want them to get too mature, you know, before the fall really hits. And if you plant them now with, with the brassicas, they're going to get too mature and then the deer are going to use They're real stemmy and almost woody and it, it, you're going to kind of be defeating your purposes. Yeah. So a brassica seed is very, very small. So what I'm going to do with this, once I have it dead, I'm going to seed that thing with the weed standing. And then I'm either going to cut them cut the weeds down right after I get that thing seeded and pack that down to actually make like a mulch or I'm going to roll that down rather than cutting that stuff and act as mulch. You can actually plant your seed and then roll over it with a cult packer. Again, you're knocking all those weeds down and it's going to act as a mulch and the brassicas are going to shoot up. And then, you know, a month later, I'm going to go back over and put my cereal grain in. That's what I would do with that plot. That's what you're doing. It's a, it's a good question. A lot of people kind of get uh, exasperated that oh, it's too late. I missed out. We did it last year in August. We talked about this before, but we did this last year in August with uh, some tall tine tubers. It was fabulous. I mean, we only got like one or two rains between, uh, it was like the first week of August and September 17th, I believe it was. But it was, by the time bow season got going, mid to late September, it was fa fantastic. And, and last year was one of those unique years where when you planted it late, you're almost better off. I planted my normal time, which is this time of year, and we didn't get our early frost. Normally we have that early frost right around the opener, and it's not a super hard frost, but it actually makes the brassica sweet. Last year, we didn't get a hard frost or, or a good frost literally till October. I literally had purple top turnips, which are normally softball size. I mean, they're basketball size. They're huge. And then they got woody. They weren't as palatable as you would like them. So unfortunately, I planted my stuff a little bit too early last year. But if it would have been a typical year, we would have been in much better shape. Not a perfect science. Yeah. And, and that's what it is. I mean, it's not perfect at all. It, 
you know, they always have on the back of those bags, if you buy any of the brands, the blended brands, they're going to give you a, a parameter of, of planting dates. And normally up here, they say August 15th. Well, that is for a little bit south of here. You know, so the further south you live, the later you can plant it. It's all based on your frost. You want about 45 days of growth before the first hard frost hits. So, you know, use that as a, a gauge to determine when you're going to plant your So products. if you need to plant a food pot, you talk to this guy, maybe even planting your yard right, right, can help you with that. I've made about every mistake possible You've been doing it pots. for 25 years. So yes. I mean, it, that's, you learn all those mistakes and you figure it out. That's a good tip uh, on the food plot aspect. We got two other questions we wanted to talk about. My screen on my iPad keeps bonking out on me here. We got, um, uh, okay, so... In conjunction with that, kind of talking about feed and, you know, things you want to have around for deer. This is a little bit of a different question. This is coming from Matt Reed from Maine. Matt, thanks for sending this one in today. Matt says, I'm going to read his whole question. He says, I have a 65-acre hunting property. Oh, not Maine, Ohio. I'm sorry, Matt. 65 acres in Ohio. Property is Hardwood Hillside. We have a really good stand site at the top of the hill. We see several good mature bucks every year during the rut that are cruising for does. However, we only see one or two mature does. I was thinking about adding a feeder to this site to get more doe activity. What do you think? I'll start and I'll let you, you chime in here, Brad. I would say it's not a bad idea, but with feeders, what I found, no matter where you are, it, it, Texas is home of feeders and they do a lot of a lot of spin feeders down there, and a lot of just um, feeding off of trucks and that that type of thing. You got you want to be careful with feeders. Number one, they got to be legal where you hunt, and you got to be using the right amount of food. But to put them in a high traffic area, not a bad idea. But I would not put it next to the, to, to the stand site for this reason. Uh, deer get accustomed to feeders as they get accustomed to food plots, and they learn they really quickly learn the game as far as hunting pressure, when they can be there, when they cannot. And people say, oh, it's turning deer nocturnal. Is it turning them nocturnal? It's just turning them nocturnal to you because they've figured you out. Yeah. Um, and I would say if you're going to do that, Matt, on your hillside, I would put it in a way or a fashion that maybe it's going to be uh, maybe drawing deer to that hillside or to that area a little bit more, maybe 100, 150, 200 yards away from your tree stand yeah. because it's going to keep that deer activity in there. And I'd keep the food to a minimum. I would just put out enough there to maybe keep deer interested rather than putting out, you know, I don't know how much you can use in Ohio, but I mean, rather than putting out gallons and gallons at a time, maybe just enough that deer know there is food there and they, you will get more does that way. Uh, especially you want them to hit there during legal shooting time. And, and if you have too much food there, it always seems like it gravitates towards nighttime. Um, you know, I've hunted places where my neighbors baited, ex you know, to use tons of food. And on those places that had mature bucks, we saw a lot less buck activity during daylight because all the food was there. They knew where the does were going to be, and they just gravitated there at night when they knew they were safe. Um, that state actually legalized, you know, or, or made it illegal, the county did, where you couldn't bait or feed anymore. And, and, you know, immediately we started seeing mature bucks again during the day. But I agree with you. I'd put that feeder in the thickest cover that I had, you know, try to hold deer close to it, even right into their bedding area if you can get in and out easily without disturbing them. Because by having a food source on your property, you're probably going to get more buck activity checking on that, you know, sporadically through the day. So you're going to keep those deer moving kind of funny we hunt in South Carolina once in a while during the early season and there they 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 chum it or bait bait huge areas and I've never seen deer so spooky in my oh, life. Oh absolutely. I mean 200 yards and you drop the pin I swear those deer would They're hear gonna it. They're going to hear it. Yeah. Gone, just Especially like if it's hunted a lot. I mean I've hunted I've hunted with bait over bait. I've hunted in different places in Texas and Wisconsin and when it was legal here. What you find out is if you hunt a, a spot that is traditionally baited um you like I said, good luck killing a mature buck. It's very, very difficult, very difficult. But it can be used in the same fashion as a food plot in the fact that, you know, a food plot is deer are browsers. They're a little bit here, a little bit here. They're not just going to come in there and fill up on, you know, their six to ten pounds of food they need on just eating brassica leaves. They're not going to do it. They're going to eat a little bit and they're going to move off in the woods and eat some acorns. Same thing here. So if you have a situation like that where you don't have a mass crop, 
and you have a hillside, a wooded hillside that's just kind of a travel area, yeah, well, you might, if you can legally, why not incorporate something like that? But just be smart about it. So that's a good question, Matt. Thank you for asking that. We got uh, one more here, and that's going to be from John Ortiz from Iowa. And this is a good one, Brad, and this is why we have all this stuff sitting here on the desk. John says, hello, I've been uh, be focusing on scent control lately. I've been using Dead Downwind products for two years now. I understand how to use pre and post deer hunting scent control products, but I would like your advice on the scent control products. He's talking about sprays uh, in the field. Do you heavily spray yourself before entering the field and after? Do you spray yourself when you reach your hunting stand? And do you spray yourself throughout the day? It's a good question. And I know we both pretty much have <laughs> equal ideas on this. Yeah, I, I'm addicted to the stuff. So, you know, if a bottle is going to last a season, it'll last me a week. You know? yep. Basically, I spray down as soon as I get out of the car, walk to my deer stand. I'm going to spray down again before I get into the stand. And I might even spray down when I'm in the stand if I start sweating bad. So uh, I'm a believer you cannot go over the top on scent control. I mean, I've seen guys using mouthwash or, or, you know, products that, that kill your bacteria in your mouth so that you don't have order coming out of your mouth. I, I take, you know, have take tablets before, you know, you name it, I, I've done it. We've done it all and we've used all the products. It's a great question John poses. Um, one thing that I always reiterate to anybody who asks this question, th this bottle of spray is not going to, it's not going to make up for other bad habits. If I'm not taking a shower with scent-free soap or scent-reducing soap, whatever you want to call it, in the morning, if I'm not doing all these little things, I mean, we do it all. We use, uh, we use scent lock. We use, you know, we use the uh, the the Ozonics. clean box. Ozonics. We use the clean boxes. Ozonics. I love it. Um, we do all these things, but the key to just getting to his point about scent sprays is um, there's a couple different things you can do. The one product that we love using, that I really love using, is Scent Killer Gold, and I actually spray this on my, even though my clothes are already scent free, I sp well, to the best of my abilities, I hang it outside and all that kind of stuff. I spray this on my clothes a day before I use it, and this will last a long time. It's got that dry technology on it, uh, and my boots, and I, and I store that away. I will also use this right when I put on my clothes outside, away from the truck, spray it, and I use it throughout the day. Same thing with Dead Down Wind, same thing with Cold Blue. Um, this stuff, and especially when you're to your stand, these early season hunts, what we all often forget about, is you're up in your stand, I'm screwing in that Ozonics into the tree, and I got it on. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I love them. They really do work. Yeah. I'm still spraying myself. Me I too. sweat like crazy. Take my ball cap off, spray that down really good. Try to let it dry out a little bit if I can. Hang it up. Spray myself again. Yes, I'd use them throughout, throughout the day and throughout the, throughout the season. I'll get... I'll get about two weeks out of one of these bottles when I'm really hunting hard. You know, I mean, if it's during peak times in October and November, you're going to get a couple weeks, but it's, they're not that expensive. And it's a little bit of uh, uh, prevention rather than going out there saying, well, I've done all this other stuff. I got my activated carbon on. I got my... You don't have to use all this stuff. You don't, but every little bit helps. For for ten bucks, and if I ever shoot a giant, I mean, it's well worth it. Every little bit helps. Yeah, absolutely. So and uh, you know, you, like I said, you don't. You can get by without it. It's absolutely. I mean, we were putting our clothes in garbage bags with pine boughs for years before any of this stuff came along. But I will tell you, I've seen a noticeable difference when you add this all together in the total scent scent uh scent free approach it works so thanks john Th thank you for your question we do have that price pack it is the deer and deer hunting wall calendar with charlie alzheimer's rut predictions in it and the other thing that we have are the brand new uh page a day we call them the white tails daily calendar these are cool you put this on your desk it's got a color photo of a deer and a little factoid you rip that off every day uh everybody who asked a question is going to get one of those so thank you john for the question now brad before we get to kendall we're going to show one more video here. Tyler's going to bring it up. Uh, this is a good friend of ours, actually good family friends of ours, the Waller brothers and their dad from down in uh, Alabama. And uh, they came up with some really cool products. And they're on, they, if, you've heard of, if you think you heard of these guys, you did. They basically founded one of the greatest tree stand companies in, this, in, in the country, and that's Summit Tree Stands. Uh, they used to own that. They ran it for years. Uh, John was just uh, very 
vital cog in the tree stand industry with the Tree Stand Manufacturers Association. But they have a new company called uh, Viking Solutions, and these are some really cool products. They've been hunters and they've been killing deer for decades, and they've been doing it very well. And a, a lot of these products are things that, why didn't I think of that, or I really wanted that. One of these is we're going to show you right now. It's called the Quick Hoist. We have this in Shop Deer today. It's basically a portable hoist that you can attach to a tree or a pole in those times when you need to either lift your deer up to get it into a vehicle, lift your deer up to skin it. A lot of guys, especially uh, these southern hunters that I've met, taught me a trick to lift your deer up to, to field dress it. I've never thought of that. I mean, growing up in Wisconsin, you field dress it right out in the woods. A lot of these guys like to bring their deer in. They don't like to leave the guts out in the field. Um, but this thing attaches to a tree really simply. You're going to see it in this video. Clamps on, holds 300 pounds with that little uh, crank. And you could, I mean, it's endless things that you can, not only deer hunting, you can use it for all sorts of things. But we have this, uh, uh, we, this is one of the four new products. We're going to show you one every week. Uh, it's called the Quick Hoist from Viking Solutions. Check it out. I think you'll really enjoy it. You could just basically throw this in the back of your car, throw this in the back of your truck, put it in the back of your ATV. It, it actually collapses. It's a really cool product. So um, I, I recommend everybody take a look at that. We have the video. You can buy it right there from Shop Deer. And again, uh, that's uh, Viking Solutions Quick Hoist, and that is from uh, on shopdeerhunting.com right now. All right, so that will take care of all that business. Okay. We're going to get on the phone with Kendall, and we're going to talk about um, a the really co one of the coolest cameras that you're going to find here. Yeah, and the thing why Dan's dialing, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, the thing that's cool about the Cahaba River camera, um, you know, not only does it stream live, but you could use it as your own personal web service. You know, so if you're worried about that monthly fee, you could have that as your internet portal at your home as long as that unit was close enough to your house. But here you go, we, we're dialing Kendall. Upper River Cameras, this is Kendall. Hey Kendall, this is Brad Rux. We're, you're live on Deer Talk Now. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I kind of did a quick intro and said you're the brains behind the Cahaba River camera. Let's let's tell everybody how you guys came up with this system. Well, how I came up with it, um, I had worked for several years in the, uh, the forestry and uh, wildlife management industry. I managed a 96,000 acre plant, plantation in Florida. And when I retired, I came to Birmingham and one of my dreams was to create everything that I wished I had had while I was in that business. Um, so I started working on, on things. I looked at uh, standard uh, trail cameras, and um, although they're, they're wonderful, absolutely wonderful, I wanted something a little bit different. Um, so I've created what we have now. Um, it's not intended in any way to replace or compete with standard trail cameras. It just offers a little bit more. It's in a different format. Um, so that's basically how we came about creating what we have now. Now tell everybody, I, I kind of went into it that it streams video live, but what are the differences between your camera and say uh, just a normal Moultrie game camera? real-time video as well as audio um, and it becomes a system a user can purchase one camera to start with and then add to it as his budget allows or his needs grow um, to include as many cameras as he likes to cover as much land as he likes it can come cover from one site at one hunting site to hundreds of acres um, and include many cameras. We've also got um, software to go with the camera system that um, compiles data. Um, a camera, for instance, uh, can recognize uh, various game species. I've got it perfected right now to do deer and turkeys, and it can recognize each individual in a and a herd uh, on your property, and every other camera that passes also 
can recognize that particular animal and compile a log of its movement patterns throughout the year. Um, in the case of a doe, it can uh, recognize uh, when she's had fawns after she passes the camera, of course, and actually gives those fawns a name related to that doe. It can keep records of those. And over a period of years, you can have um, quite a bit of data on, on the wildlife within your, your property boundary. Kendall, this is Dan Schmidt. I'm a, Brad's partner here at Deer Talk. I wanted to ask you a question on, you know, we've, we've been playing around with this camera. We've been watching the live feed on the website. What, what is the capacity as far as looking back? I know when we log on there in the morning, we can look back a few hours. Is that something that can be adjusted or is there, is there other settings on there? Yes, it can be adjusted. And you can, if you notice on the uh, software page, you can go back in dates. Um, I think your camera is set to record for a period of five to seven days. That's typically how I ship them out. But it can have um, maximum storage, which in most cases would handle about 30 days before the SD card is full. Um, what we use is an onboard SD card on each camera to, to hold recordings um, so that it's bandwidth bandwidth friendly to the end user. You can come back for very little use of your bandwidth plan, view your recordings, and of course when you have special ones that you want to save, you can just click download and it will save and download those into a file. So yes, you can sit and manage that from one day to unlimited. What are, what are some of the responses you're getting or or some of the maybe examples of guys who are using these to manage their deer herds? Um, right now, we started a, a couple years ago, in fact, selling individual cameras. And I guess the best response we could possibly have is what we're seeing now. Those users have came back. In most cases, they decide they want three or four additional cameras. And they purchase further cameras. And then some have came back and purchased even more again. And of course, the way our business has spread so far, the best way has been word of mouth from those customers recommending to another customer. Have you had to run into any problems at all with this not, not being compliant with state laws anywhere? Uh, absolutely not. Now, um, they're not to be used um, like our two-way audio, you can download game calls and so forth. And to use those calls, like for instance, if I were to download a bunch of turkey calls and use it actively hunting turkeys, it would be the only legal requirement, you know, infringement on the law anyway, to do that. Um, we don't recommend it. They're not intended for that purpose. Um, and, and these are really, the system is designed to be a long-term, uh, they're sort of semi-permanent installations. They can, they can be easily moved, but it's more of a long-term uh, management tool rather than just a scouting tool. Now, Kendall, let's talk a little bit about pricing-wise. If, if a guy's just going to get one of your base units, you know, with a attendant uh, tenant and all that stuff, how much is that going to run them? Okay, one base unit. Um, I believe our prices are they're a little high if you compare them to trail cameras. They start at about fourteen hundred dollars. Now, what that does though is gives you the basic piece that you need to start an entire network. We're actually getting more than just a camera there. Um, another feature of our camera that comes with it, I have to mention now, is um, high-speed internet access. And that's been a big use by many of our customers um, that have property um, and even some outfitters now that are using ours in remote locations to provide high-speed internet access as well as 
this is, I mean, and I guess we have to show people what we're talking about here, but this isn't just a camera that you strap into a tree. This is an entire system. Uh, like, like you were saying, Brad, you, you, it's your own IP address. You're getting, you're getting the high-speed internet, uh, and you're you're getting you're getting basically what is essentially a surveillance camera that you can put over any part of your property that at, you want. You know, if I lived out of state and had a really nice hunting cabin on a property, I would definitely have one of these overlooking the property because not only would you have internet access at that camp now, but you could go on it 24/7, and if anybody ever does break in, you got recordings. Of, that are of them catalog that you, yeah, can, that you can retrieve. Yeah, So uh, this is a great, great system. Kendall, when you shipped that, I, I know the one that you had set up for us had two deep 12-volt batteries. Is that how they all come, or, or is that was ours an extra? Um, yours, the, the only reason yours has two is because um, you were going to add it to your website and so forth, and I knew there'd be a excessive use on there. Yes. Um, I think it would operate just fine with only one, but I, I did that for redundancy in your case. Um, you know, we didn't want it going down. Yes. Um, and there again, uh, our systems are, one thing I do need to mention, are, are solar powered. Um, they're perpetually powered. Um, I believe yours has been out for close to a year now through winter, all sorts. Really of bad winter. Really oh. bad, extreme cold. I mean, it was. It was. We had fifty-seven day, days below zero this past winter here, so it was. It, it withstood the elements quite nicely. Yeah, it was overlooking a nice snowbank because none of the deer were living down there this winter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what now? Let's before we just got a couple minutes here with you, Kendall. What now? Okay, there's a guy out there. He's interested. He wants to get one of these cameras. Uh, a couple things. What does he do next? And what are, are there other costs involved after the initial setup? Okay. No, there are not other costs except for when he wants to add more additional cameras. Um, there are costs, of course, involved in purchasing the additional cameras. Uh, and uh, the features and options are practically unlimited. But the next step or the first step upon purchasing is when you make a request um, to our company, just expressing your interest, um, it'll get passed along to me, which I contact that person. In fact, I'm doing that right now. <laughs> I have a Google Earth map of a piece of property, and I'm doing a site survey, I call it, this piece of property of what we can and can't do. And I will start an email conversation, uh, passing back and forth that information to the end customer so we specifically tailor the device to fit your needs. I'd say that's pretty good. They're getting your your, your personal assistance on it. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah, you're basically customizing. Kendall, the one fee you do have is your cell service fee per month, correct? That is correct. And um, one thing I do want to say is we are actually, our business has been good, so we're moving to a uh, another tier of service from um, several companies, including AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile, where we're even getting vastly reduced charges. Um, the typical system costs about, um, this is a camera system um, now with, let's say, four cameras, cost about $50 per month. I pay it right now, Kendall. If that was closer to my home, uh, I'm paying over a hundred dollars for internet access right now, and, and your system would be faster than what I'm using. Faster and cheaper, yeah. Faster and cheaper. So that's, you know, even though it sounds like a lot of money, you, you, most of these units are going up in rural America, and sell for well, internet connection is internet tough connection. to get without being you expensive. You have to get a dish anyway. So yeah. I mean, this is this it, is a, it is actually a, a really nice side benefit of this yes. camera is the fact that. Like you said, at a hunting camp, or even if it's just hunting land that you have, uh, you're going to have internet access where you probably wouldn't have it otherwise. Before. Correct. So. That is correct, and our sales are expanding now into the agricultural market where quite a few farmers now. Um, I've only sold one to a farmer, but I'm getting more and more inquiries now, and of course there's many agricultural applications that I easily add from uh, GPS positioning of their uh, tractors while they're planting and so forth and harvesting their, um, so 
cool. System is designed for actually wildlife management, um, forestry, and agriculture applications. Very cool. Well, Kendall, we want to thank you very much for joining us today and giving us some insights on that. And uh, we're going to tell the folks more about it when we get off the phone with you. But again, thank you for joining us today for Deer Talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, take care, Kendall. That's very cool. Kendall, you know, what, what is really neat about that, Brad, is it, it took me a while. Yeah, we've seen cameras. We've been told all these promises on some that have kind of been introduced and kind of fell by the wayside by various uh, upstart manufacturers. But this one's the real deal. And you can look at it right there on the homepage and see that this is just not some little cheap camera. It is the real deal that it actually has got a big solid base that you have to install to get that thing going. Yeah, but once it's in place, if you put it in a high traffic area, you're gonna be able to monitor all the deer in that area. I mean, I, I think it is a great tool for for a person that owns his own property and, and maybe he doesn't live there all the time. If I, I if I had property that was out of state, say if I had I would, a farm in I agree Iowa, 100%. I would have one. And I would these. have an extra camera, right? Oh. I'm like, I mean, you, basically you'd have a deer surveillance, wildlife surveillance camera and a security system. You'd have, you could have a camera mounted overlooking your, your cabin. Yeah, it's the best of um, both worlds. So if anybody ever broke into your cabin, you'd have it right there. And what the cool thing is, is and I, I must admit I didn't look enough into our program that we have up there, but you can go back and look at, well, we were doing that yesterday. We saw those three, three really bucks. nice bucks coming on the camera, and that was really cool to see. Um, and it was during daylight, but I mean, you, you could, you can go back and if somebody, one of the, actually another I think somebody off of Facebook said, yeah, I saw a nice deer at 7 o'clock last night. You can go back and look at it. You don't have to sit there. And it's like, there is some referencing. There is a toggle bar on there that helps you a little bit because there's a lot of times where it's static and there's nothing. Yeah. But you can toggle back and, whoop, something just went past the camera. Back up. Oh, it was a turkey. It was a deer. It was a bobcat, whatever. Yeah. Kind of cool. And it actually, I mean, a really good scouting tool. If you want to, if you got it on a good food plot, a really good scouting tool on to knowing when deer are, hitting that, what they're eating, what parts of the field they're eating at, and all sorts of other information. The one we had used last fall had just this enormous solar panel on it, and I was really worried about the whitetail spooking from it. And I, I, you put it in a food plot, and you're just trying to get footage of deer in the food plot, and I was like, oh my God, these things are going to freak out. But because that thing was stagnant, yeah, for the first week, the deer ate on the other end of the food plot. By the end of the first week, they they'll, they're eating right in front of it. I mean, they don't think anything of it anymore. So it's almost like you know, a permanent ground blind or something that the, the deer got totally used to it. And, and one of the coolest clips, and I, I didn't save it for whatever reason, but last fall, right when the rut was really starting to peak, a, a doe ran by the camera that must have been in heat, and right behind her was a really nice buck. And then as, just like you're in the field, shortly thereafter, in comes another little year and a half old, then another year and a half old, then another two-year-old, and they're all on that same doe that was in heat, and every one of them was grunting. It was pretty cool. Very you know, cool. that's the kind of footage you get. Cahaba River camera, right there on our homepage, deerandeerhunting.com. Check it out. That's it for this week. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Join us again next week where we're going to take more of your questions and we're going to be giving out more prizes. For Brad Rocks, I'm Dan Schmidt. Thanks for joining us for Deer Talk Now and have a great week.